Welcome back to the second part of the chop anatomy workshop. In the last episode, we talked about the difference between a sample, a frame, what is the effect of a sampling rate of a chop and extend condition and some other small things. And today we're going to talk about time slicing and we're going to see what happens when we start to lose frames and how can we remedy some of the issues that it can cause. And if you like my content, please consider subscribing and following me on Patreon also. There's a lot more there, even on the free tier. All right, we have finally reached the topic of time slicing. Um, we've talked about time slices before, but this is going to be in a little bit of a different context. We're going to take a look at what happens to your chops when you start losing frames, what kind of anomalies that happen and how you can deal with that and why you should be aware of time slicing. As a reminder, we will be using the hog chop quite a lot. And the hog chop is useful to simulate CPU load. As you can see, as I'm increasing this delay, I'm losing more and more frames. And I actually have it mapped to my MIDI controller. And you can also find it in my toolbar under this big icon. I use this quite a lot when testing my control networks. So far when we said time slicing, uh, we used it in a context where we had an animation channel, multi-sample animation channel, and then we wanted to play a single sample of it that you can call a time slice. And when you middle click on a chop, you can actually see if something is time sliced. Um, this is not time sliced and this becomes time sliced with a time slice. And the LFO, for example, by default is time sliced. There is a time slice page on derivatives documentation. You can read this, um, but basically I'm just going to read it here. Time slicing is a feature in Touch Designer that keeps your chop channels smooth. Even when your frame rate goes down, and your timeline skips frames. Time slicing keeps your overall animation smoother and more accurate and helps keep your audio from popping when your frame rate drops. A time slice is a time from the last cook frame to the current cook frame. In chops, it is the set of short channels that contain the chop channels samples between the last and the current cook frame. If you take a look at this LFO, um, it is time sliced. And when I start losing my frames, um, even though I'm losing frames, all samples of the LFO show up in this trail. In contrast, um, a constant chop, for example, is not time sliced. As you can see it here, I have apps times at seconds animating this constant value. And when I start losing frames, I'm actually losing information between frames that are not rendered. Um, we will see it in a second why this might be important. And we can also see, by the way, when I middle click on this, um, that this is now seven samples long, actually, this LFO. However, time slicing can cause issues. For example, here's a shuffle. I didn't even set anything here, but you, we can see this glitch happening from time to time. And if I start losing more frames, then this actually becomes a multi-sample chop. Or if I set the shuffle chop to swap channels and samples, we will see that as we start losing more and more frames, more channels appear here. And these actually represent the time slices, the frame values that we lost. So this can cause issues down the line. We will see an example later. But for now, we should be happy that it's happening because um, it's making sure that our animation can stay smooth in certain situations. And we're going to see when it matters. Uh, but for now, let's take a look at this speed, which is pretty similar to this constant. There's a constant running into this speed. This speed is now time slide. So when I start losing my frames, it is accumulating these lost frames. And when I look at the trail, this speed is smooth, but very smooth. I also put here a custom parameter that is driven by the same speed that this is. Um, but the parameter chop, um, just like the constant chop, is actually not time sliced. So you will see that this has jumps as well. Let's use these channels to animate the circle, just as an example. Uh, we can see that when I start losing frames, um, of course, the animation gets laggy, jagged, and no matter which chop I use, we actually get the same result. So when does this matter? Finally, we can talk about when time slicing matters, because so far we are just happy to have it. It doesn't really interfere with anything that we, that we do, um, but when, when does it actually interfere? Here's an example where we can much more clearly see it because we have quickly changing values and we have these same filters. One noise here is with a time slice, we have to 
specifically turn this on to be time sliced and then the other one is not time sliced we have the same filter going on so these are this is the first time sliced noise it's filtered version and non time sliced noise and then it's filtered version and when i start losing frames we can see the difference clear as day um, when we are processing the non time sliced noise we are actually getting very far from the output when we were not losing frames as you can see here and with the time sliced one we are keeping the same shape still you could be saying hey but actually we can only render uh, an output for an animation when we are cooking actually so why does it matter that when we are not cooking we are losing frames these values are getting updated correctly well the thing is that these filters they have an internal state and when I pause it here, if you think about it, because these intermediate values that were not updated correctly, we actually have quote unquote invalid current value because these are not, not what they should be. Here we have this current value, which we know that is correct because all the missing samples were calculated before. A filter and also many other operators have an internal state. And if that internal state is not kept consistent when we are losing frames, then the current output is basically invalid. Still can be usable, but if you want a consistent and smooth chop experience, uh, you should be working with time sliced chops. If I actually put down a perform chop and turn these on, we can actually see what's going on um, with our time slices, like how many dropped frames we have, how many time slices we're accumulating per frame. But what I really wanna show here is uh is this thing so let's say that we have this lfo and we start losing frames as we do now um here this channel one is the lfo this channel two here is um taking the lfo and inputting it to a constant job um as you can see we're actually losing some of those pulses that this lfo pulse is producing and that is because, as I mentioned before, the constant chop, for example, is not time sliced. And what we can also see here is what's interesting. If we put an analyze uh, after this LFO, what we see is um, when it's on average, uh, even though the pulse is producing zero and one, this average is somewhere in between because it's averaging actually the time slices, not uh, the value. So also when I put it to maximum, and I increase a little bit the delay, uh, we can see that it doesn't just produce a single peak, it produces a held one value because the maximum is one over a period of the time slice. So this can this can mess you up um, in in some ways, or it can also be beneficial. Uh, depends depends on the situation, I guess, but it's definitely good to be aware of this. Another thing we can observe here, uh, I just put down a chop execute that's going to print the current frame and it's just connected to the LFO directly. And let's see our text port. So even though we are losing a lot of frames, we are getting consistently um, this chop execute working because this null coming from this LFO one is time sliced. But let's see, for example, what happens when we have a custom parameter, a pulse, and we simply reference this LFO's output to this custom parameter. And then we also have a parameter execute that executes whenever this pulse gets pulsed. So let's see what happens. In principle, this should happen at the same time because this LFO pulse is running this chop execute script. That's this one, but it also should be pulsing this custom parameter, which should be printing this pulse message. So as you can see, it doesn't, doesn't happen at the same time. We are missing some of those pulses. Interestingly, if I manually pulse this custom parameter, we are actually not losing any of those clicks. Also very interesting. Let's remove this reference here to this pulse. Um, and let's actually pulse our custom parameter from this chop execute. Let's see what happens. In this case, we don't seem to be losing any of those pulses. 
no matter how many frames we are losing, that pass happens from the chop execute. And finally, if we wanted to still pulse uh, this pulse from, from this LFO, the way that we could do this, that we got a consistent pulse, um, is actually if we take this analyze that I showed before and put it to maximum and reference that for our pulse, then as we can see here, suddenly all of those pulses get through. Um, if I do just the LFO, the currently cooking, cooking frame doesn't always coincide with the value one. As opposed to when we have the analyze uh, we, at the maximum, uh, we guarantee that when we are cooking, this time slice that we captured in this analyze um, outputs one, thus triggering the pulse. And if you think that all of this is messed up and suddenly you don't understand touch designer and you feel lost and, and, and you're really shattered uh, by this, uh, don't. I mean, um, you've been fine so far. It's just good to be aware of this. If you face an issue like this, you now know where to, where to look and why it happens. And it's also good news because uh, I'm sure you've faced such an issue where losing frames caused some instability or some unexpected things. And by knowing how to deal with time slices and, and these, these little weirdnesses, uh, you can actually fix those issues. You can come over those issues and a frame loss doesn't have to be the end of your signal. But the issues and the learning don't stop there when it comes to time slicing, which is there to help you, but it also is there to cause some issues sometimes. And this is a super important part of this video. So we have an LFO here. You, for whatever reason, decide to shuffle it to a multi-sample. Because why not? You know, sometimes you, you feel like that. Um, and then you want to filter these samples. So first of all, the filter would look like this. It is time-sliced and our input is not time-sliced. After the shuffle, it becomes actually not time-sliced. Um, so we have two options. The first one is either we turn it off time slice, but then um, I don't know what's happening here. And then the other option is to set it to filter per sample. And then there's also something weird happening here um, that we do not really expect. Why are those things happening and how can we fix those? So first of all, when I turn time slicing off, uh, it's just so messed up that I won't even get into why that is wrong. I don't even fully understand. Um, but what's more important is when we turn this to filter per sample, which, you know, could make sense. Um, then the problem is that the filter is expecting to work on the same time slice that starts from the same frame and ends on the same frame. And what we see here in the shuffle that this is actually rolling, like this is, this is always changing the start and the end frame is always different. So the filter doesn't know how to deal with that. There's an easy fix to that. If we add a trim chop, then because the shift start to zero is on by default, then we can actually at least filter per sample. Also, if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed that sometimes another channel pops up here and things like that. So maybe when I, when I move my window here, you see like that's happening. And that is because we're losing frames. And as you know, when we're losing frames with these time sliced chops, uh, we are accumulating those lost frames. And when we eventually, for whatever reason, shuffle that into a multi sample chop, then all those extra hidden samples get shuffled into extra chop channels, which as you can see, can cause a lot of issues. And I think in the intro, I mentioned that this can cause exponential um, errors or exponential lost frames. Um, that is because if we look at this filter here, this is currently taking about 0.004 milliseconds. When I start losing frames because of all these extra samples and channels, we're up to sometimes up to 0 0.0, 30, 15, uh, definitely much more than before. And that is not because we are losing frames. It would still be 0 0.004. Um, it's because of these extra channels and extra data that the filter shop now has to deal with. Okay, then how do we prevent this from happening? And one way to do that is to insert a trim chop before our shuffle and set it to absolute. So it will only take one sample from the slice that is coming in. 
With this, we have to be careful though, because essentially we're losing uh, the time slices. So if I were to put here uh, something that is expecting time sliced input or is working best with time sliced input, um, then that can cause those issues that we saw before with inaccurate processing. Or if not the trim, the analyze can also consolidate those extra time slices down to a non-time sliced job, as we can see here with the maximum or the average. Um, I guess it depends how you look at it. But now we can verify that our fil filter job is actually taking still around 0 0.004 milliseconds of processing as opposed to when we had to deal with all these extra stuff and we were getting 15 or whatever. Okay, this is it for this part of the video or episode. Stay tuned for cooking tips.